Have you ever been at a point in your life where you said, I need a miracle, I need help, I just need the situation to change? I'm in such a mess and it feels like it is hopeless. Well, today on The Perspective, I'm glad you've tuned in. I have a guest back with us who hasn't been on for a while, but his name is Dr. Gary Onik. Sometimes people refer to him as Dr. Hope. Uh, God has enabled him to do amazing things uh, through surgery, in dealing with cancer, in uh, developing new techniques, but also, as you're going to hear from him, uh, a special aspect of what he does involves prayer. Now, prayer is something that is available to all of us. You might not be available to the best surgeon or the medical facilities where you are, but God says he is the great physician, that we can call out to him for prayer, that we can call to him and share with him our needs at any time. And so here at The Perspective, we believe in that. And as I change uh, this whole subject, as, as we address this whole subject, I want to invite you to change your mindset, to be open to what God wants to give you. At any time, you can call 855 910 6297. That's our prayer line. It's open 24 7 around the world. 855 910 6297. There are people here to pray with you. But listen as we unpack together Gary's own personal story and what he's involved with right now in bringing hope to people. So, uh, Dr. Onik, I want to welcome you back to the program. Good to see you today. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, and uh, you're looking well. You got the white gown on. You've just told me that you just didn't come out of surgery. That was yesterday when we were talking. No, no. Yeah, today's the day that I sell ice cream. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, well, you know I what? I don't know what that means. I I'd like uh, some chocolate chip and uh, a little pistachio on the top. That would be good. Um, <laughs> you know, when you think of ice cream, any day with ice cream is a good day with ice cream. But it you is. know, you know what I've learned, Gary, is that it's easy to have our hopes dashed. And it doesn't matter how old we are. Not I'm saying that you and I are old. I'm not saying that for a moment, okay? <laughs> but I think we still feel the same thing when the top of our ice cream gets knocked over and lands on the ground. Our hopes get dashed. Uh, and absolutely. It, it's, it's, a, um, it's an indication things aren't going to go well that day. <laughs> Many people refer to you as Dr. Hope, but you had an experience in your own life when your own hopes were dashed. I want you to take us back to that moment, if you wouldn't mind, when you found out that the big C word was uh, imprinted on you as well. Sure. I mean, uh, I spend my days talking to patients with, uh, with cancer. And, um, you know, when everybody th thinks they're not going to get it or everybody's life is going on and they're thinking about all, everything else uh, that their life entails. And then one day their life changes markedly when somebody says, you know, you've got cancer. And so I was, um, I was having some troubles. I was having difficulty urinating. And, and uh, so I thought, well, it's about time to look into this. So I, I got a, a scan and what it showed was that um, I had prostate cancer all over my body. Um, I had it in, um, obviously my prostate, which had a huge mass, which is why I was having trouble being. I also had it in my lymph nodes and all my bones. And, um, you know, basically my PSA was 138. Normal is about four. Wow. So, um, you know, I'm looking at the scan as it's coming up because I'm a radiologist and I went back to look at the, um, the pictures as they're coming up and I'm going, hope that's somebody else, <laughs> but it wasn't somebody else. It was me. And, um, you know, all of a sudden I had to deal with what my patients were always dealing with. And, um, I came to a, a conclusion rather quickly. I, if you know, the, um, uh, Elizabeth Kubler Ross has, uh, the five or six stages of, of dying. And, um, there was, you know, the last stages, which is finally acceptance. And, um, I decided that since I had a pretty good faith by then, um, that, um, I would go right to acceptance. So literally in a day, I went through all five <laughs> stages and, uh, just accepted what was going to happen to me. Wow. Um, the, uh, interesting aspect of it was that 
the usual way that you treat patients in my situation is castration. And, um, you know, there are lots of jokes we can make about that, but uh, it wasn't funny at the time. And I, but I decided that wasn't for me. I'm not, you know, uh, um, I, I had a great life up until that point and a lot of, you know, uh, interesting, important things and, and felt very satisfied with my life. And I felt that, uh, you know, I would try and just die gracefully. Um, but I did have two, um, two things open to me. One was prayer. And um, I felt that that could be a, a very important aspect. Uh, Can I jump in for, for a minute? Possible... Let me jump sure. in, Gary, because, I mean, we really need about two hours to unpack this story. But you had noticed something with many of your patients, those that had friends praying for them and those that hadn't. Can you just enlarge on that for a moment and then go back to your story? Yes, I, I think the the the, um, the complete change in my thinking about prayer uh, happened when a patient came to me. Uh, he was five years up out from his, I had seen him five years ago, or at that time, five years ago. And um, he had had a um, colon cancer that had spread to his liver. And that's 100% fatal. And um, he had decided that he wasn't going to have chemotherapy, wasn't going to have anything. Um, and he was just going to have people pray for him. And they set up a prayer chain around the world. And he had uh, millions of people praying for him. And wow. sure enough, uh, he comes back to me five years later for something else. And his tumor is gone. I mean, it's this calcified ball that you know was not active and he had no colon cancer. And I said, well, that kind of proves the point. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if you're going to be shown something uh, and you want to, you know, you're a scientist, and you want to keep your eyes open, uh, this tells you uh, something. And then I did a lot of research about what is the fundamental basis for prayers being delivered. What is the actual science behind it? Uh, you know, how do prayers potentially affect things uh, in, in real time and over great distances? And so, um, you know, I did a lot of research on that. And, and the quantum physics um, is there to fully explain how prayer works. And so, um, you know, now that I had uh, evidence in, in a person and a scientific basis, see, I'm a scientist. Yep. Well, you were um, also somewhat of a self-described uh, atheist. Is that not true? Like, oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that most scientists uh, start out that way. Okay. And only as experience uh, in in the things of real life uh, go on and change them uh, that they become uh, believers in something you know greater than themselves and. Uh, I, I think as a doctor, it's a tremendous advantage uh, to believe about things greater than yourself because, um, you know, as a doctor, you have to be humble. Uh, <laughs> you know, you can't think it's about you. It's not about you. It's it's about the patient and uh, their God and our God. And, and um, if you can't cure them, making their stay that's left as good as it can be. Very just before we go to the break, take the last minute, and I know it's it's going to be a challenge, but summarize what happened. You had surgery and how that happened. I mean, it's a funny story. I'm glad you didn't ask me to operate, uh, but you had a buddy come in and do the operation. He gave you a spinal so you could talk him through the surgery. Explain that whole thing yes. and then how you experienced a radical healing afterwards as well. Absolutely. So, so we had prayer. And then the other thing that I had was a procedure or treatment that only I was, I was the only person in the world that knew how to do it. And I had uh, had some quite remarkable results on prostate cancer patients similar to myself at that time. Um, but I was the only person that could do the procedure. So I called up one of my friends uh, and I said, uh, look, and I knew he could do the procedure. He just didn't know how, but he had the skills. 
And so I said, look, I will you know, take a spinal anesthesia and I'll be awake during the procedure and you can do the operation and I'll tell you how to do it. <laughs> and um, his, uh, I quote, you're out of your mind. <laughs> it's what he said to me. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, <laughs> he did this with actually great skill and, and great humor. And we were, you know, there were a number of times where we were laughing during the procedure. And we I made a video it. I love of it, it, Gary. There's hope for me because I can watch the YouTube videos. I'm going to come down and assist you next time. <laughs> okay. Actually, anybody, you know, I probably could have told anybody how to do that. <laughs> So what happened you have next? A smart what ha dog at home. I what happened probably, next? What, what happened doing? next? Tell us what happened next. <laughs> well, what happened next was that in um, you know eight weeks I had no cancer. Wow. And but the um, you also in the lymph nodes that was all gone as well. Is that not the correct? lymph nodes, the bones? Um, it was all gone. I had no metastatic cancer. And um, um, I in December, December third. I reached my five-year uh, survival uh, without any metastatic cancer. So, um, you know, I was given a miracle because I was the only person in the world that could have done that procedure. I was the only person in the world that had the knowledge to do it. And um, I believe, you know, God put me in this position to have to do it to prove a point. Um, and to uh, keep me going so that I could do what I needed to do in these next years to uh, bring this to many more people. Well, we're going to be back in just a moment, and Gary's going to unpack even more of what's been happening since you're watching The Perspective. And we want to invite you to, con to call us and receive prayer, 855-910-6297. I'll be back in just a moment with Dr. Gary Onik. Will you donate two hours of your time? Crossroads Prayer Center is seeking people with a heart willing to join in the amazing work God is doing through prayer. Providing over 1,300 prayer interactions daily, Crossroads Prayer Partners speak biblical truth and words of life over people's need. Join in God's transforming work through prayer and enrich your faith. Learn more at crossroads.ca slash prayer volunteer. I'm back with Dr. Gary Onik, who is often referred to as Dr. Hope. Uh, Gary, while I made the overture that I would come and help with your next surgery, um, you know what? You don't want me there. I'd probably spill the coffee on the patient, and that would just yes, be chaos is. as well. <laughs> you recovered. You've been five years. And yes. um, were you surprised? No, um, I really wasn't. Um, I had faith that this was going to happen to me, um, because it would have been too ironic, uh, to come all that way and just to die from the thing that I had been, uh, curing other people with, you know, for, so I, I, you know, I, I just kind of knew that, that I'd be all right. Your story is all over. It's on, uh, you know, you can Google it, you can watch it. And I've listened to some of the talks that you've given. You're a grad of Harvard. Uh, I heard that um, that's a pretty good school. At least that's the, that's the word on be. the street. <laughs> and so At least. I'm being a little facetious here. What, do, you, what uh, do your peers and colleagues think when you bring in the whole aspect of the supernatural? Are they saying, are they going rah, rah, rah? Or are they uh, a little standoffish? Um. Well, you know, they're a little standoffish, some of them. Um, I've been told, obviously, we've been trying to raise money to uh, bring this, this really, um, what can be a miraculous treatment to other patients. And um, uh, I've been told a number of times 
you know, don't talk about the God thing. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, in fact, you can't separate the two because this is, um, you know, what my job has been given to me. And so, um, you know, I, I think that it, I felt that in the end, um, the story would be an advantage because we'd find the right person who would help us do this. And I think we've found that person. Um, I don't think I should tell you his name yet, but um, I think at some point it might be interesting to have us both on and talk about uh, what the interaction was and, and how he felt about that. So I think we're, um, we're, we're on our way, but um, you know, the, the faith is having a hard time right now um, out of there in general. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, forces that want to suppress it. And I think that, um, you know, we have to fight against that. So because, when, uh, you, when you say those things, I mean, some of the pushback would say, really, doesn't everybody want everyone to get well? Um, what is the tension without going into the weeds? What's the tension between the pharmaceutical companies and, and breakthrough in science? And then this strange doctor who believes in science has developed all this stuff, but also believes in the power of prayer. What does that pushback look like? Well, do you know, the, the pharmaceutical companies um, didn't really push back. Um, they just ignored us. They, <laughs> I mean, and that's almost worse. <laughs> they don't even know you're there. Um, we just never actually got to speak to anyone in the pharmaceutical industry. We were, um, you know, we were hitting middle managers with these ideas. And, um, you know, nobody who's a middle manager in a large company um, you know, gets in trouble for, for passing up the next, you know, big thing. They get in trouble for working with something that fails. And mm. so that's what we were running against, uh, running up against. However, um, you know, God has, has given us some, some, uh, some positive things lately. And we talked to our first major pharmaceutical executive, um, just last week. Uh, who had an extremely positive uh, outlook on what we were doing. So, um, you know, we just need to find the right people. I'm excited to hear that. But in the midst of that, you still have your own personal journey. And it's one thing to be helping other people. But there are times when, uh, as we've already been talking about this whole week on the program, we run into the proverbial brick wall, where it seems we have something that we can't scale. You have a beautiful daughter named Emily. and she has had some challenges and uh, you've agreed to share a little bit of that story so that we can understand the tension uh, between faith in God and, and living life on the streets when it seems like our prayers are not being answered the way that we would want. Unpack that story for us briefly. Yes. Um, you know, Emily is, you know, just a lovely girl and, and uh, you know, my only daughter. So, She's the light of my life. And um, uh, she was diagnosed about six weeks ago with ALS. Uh, wow. ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, is Lou Gehrig's disease, it's also known as. And, um, you know, it's virtually 100% fatal. There are, you know, 45 patients, cases in the literature where somebody has recovered from it. Um, and nobody knows why those patients recovered. So, um, you know, all of a sudden, you know, we're faced with this, um, you know, very, very tragic, difficult situation where, you know, someone you love is is going to be, uh, you know, passing on unless you get a miracle and in a very, very difficult way because of the way they these patients lose their function. You know, at the end, you know, they can be paralyzed so they can't talk, they can't swallow, they can't eat. Um you know, uh, I mean, they can't walk. It's just, you know, an awful, awful uh, situation. What I learned, however, is that sometimes these awful situations um, do have silver linings. Um, I can look at my the arc of my life and I can see that, um, you know, sometimes there were, well, there were many times when terrible, terrible things happened to me. Um, and, 
yet all of them, uh, I can say now, were incredibly important in putting me where I am today, not only in my faith, but in the things I've invented and the, the, the good things that I've done. And so uh, I am hoping um, and I do believe that, that there is a reason for this to be happening. We might not be able to see it right now. Uh, we can't understand all the things that um, God does, but I do believe that there's a reason for all of the things that happen to us. And mm. so if you have faith, you go, well, it's time to just deal with what we're given, <laughs> uh, whether you like it or not. And that's well, what we're trying to do. Well, Gary, I just appreciate your transparency as you share something that even medically uh, is beyond your grasp to know how to fix. But as I said to you, uh, there are many people watching today that feel like their problem is unsolvable. But I want to remind them that we have a God who cares. We have a God of the miraculous. And as we wrap up today, Gary, I would like to pray for you. And I want to invite thousands of viewers that are watching right now to pray with us for Gary, with the work that he does, but also for his daughter, Emily, that she would know God's peace and grace and his healing hand. So we're going to pray. So folks, wherever you are, just join with me. And Heavenly Father, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Savior, that your blessing would be upon our friend Gary Onik. Thank you for the work you've allowed him to do, to accomplish. We pray that this would increase in ways we could not imagine. But I also pray specifically for Emily. We pray a blessing upon her, but we ask for your healing, that you would touch every part of her body and give her the miracle of life. And through this, oh God, we pray that many people will come to know and realize that you do love us, you care for us. And even when death is facing us head on, you are there with us because you have defeated death. And in you, we find hope. Amen. Amen. Gary, thank you for being with us. As always, a privilege. Mike, thank you so much. It's greatly thank appreciated. And um, I'm sure those prayers will have some effect. Stay with us, folks. We'll be right back as I wrap up teaching on a whole subject that's called Messy Lives. Hi, I'm Ryan Walter. And playing in the NHL, I was so fortunate to win a Stanley Cup ring. So thankful with the Montreal Canadiens in 1986. Now, Jenny and I, we had the ring in our home and we lost the ring. Can you believe losing a Stanley Cup ring? Couldn't find it. We looked everywhere. We were scouring, finally found it in the drawer of our, our daughter, Christy. <laughs> she was young, she took the ring, it must have been sparkly, and, and she put it in her drawer. Uh, here's what I'd like to leave you with. So in Mark 10, it says, ask and you shall receive, seek and you'll find it. We were seeking, uh, knock and the door will be opened. Three great ideas in our Christian walk, ask, seek and knock. Most likely, every one of us would say that there's a part of our life that has been kind of messy that we don't want anyone to know about. Maybe that's happening right now in your life. And we've been doing this series of teachings out of the book of Ruth called Messy Lives. But is there a solution for the mess that we're in? And there is. And that answer is found, that solution is found in a simple word that's called grace. And grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. The story of Ruth is uh, like an incredible theatrical performance. We see act one where we meet all the different players in the story. We hear about them. Suddenly, as we move into the middle of the first chapter, we see the crisis. We see the wrong choices that are made in the midst of frightening moments when famine and starvation are encompassing the land of Israel. 
and a bad decision is made and the consequences go from bad to worse and even to fateful with the loss of a husband and two sons. And now Ruth and Naomi have chosen to go back to Bethlehem. Ruth is the outsider. She's the outcast. She's going to be looked at with disdain when she comes back. And so will Naomi because Naomi left when she should have stayed. All those things are against them. But you know what? If you feel like everything is against you, I want you to know that there is grace. Because all that I need to be like Christ in the daily grind of life is found in what we in this promise in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, where the Apostle Paul writes, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. But guess what? When you choose to trust God, you're going to be tempted. You're going to be tempted to compromise. And suddenly, as they get back to Bethlehem, it's the harvest season. They're looking to find food. And Ruth is in the fields gleaning uh, the grain that has fallen from the other reapers. She is on Poverty Row trying to find enough just to make some bread for herself and her mother-in-law each day. And God provides through a generous man named Boaz who tells his reapers to leave the excess on the ground, not to pick it up. And there's enough for Ruth to live. And then she suddenly realizes that there's the potential that this man could actually take care of them for the rest of life because he's a distant relative. But it's so easy to compromise. It would be so easy for the whole sexual area to come into compromise and for her to present herself as she is much younger than this older man Boaz as someone that he could take in and take advantage of. But she chooses not to. And she chooses to say, I'm going to trust that God is going to be with me. I'm going to remain upright. I'm going to remain noble. And I'm going to resist compromise. And what we find, friends, is that in the midst of messy situations in life, whether it's sexual, whether it's ethical, whether it's an addiction, whether it is, uh, you know, just a little bit of a dirty business deal, that God invites us always to take the high road, to trust him to realize that his way is the right way. And as the Bible said, my ways are not your ways, says the Lord. He invites us to trust him. And that's always the case. I'd like to invite you today to put your trust in God. Your situation is not beyond his grasp. And he is there as the savior who's willing to forgive you and I for our sins and invites us to pray even this simple prayer. Would you pray it with me, Lord Jesus? I'm surrendering my life to you. I'm asking you to be my leader and Lord, to be my savior today. And if you've prayed that simple prayer, it's the start of your new life with God. I'd love to hear from you. You can call me on the prayer number listed below or write me prayer at the perspective.tv.